Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's seminar um, hosted by Garden Court in consort with the Air Centre. And we're looking at um, the anniversary, the 70th anniversary of the European Convention on Human Rights. And of course, at about the same time, it rather happily tends to be the 20th anniversary of the Human Rights Act. So it's a, a, a merry birthday for both instruments. Uh, and this evening, I'm very pleased to say that we've got two of the UK's most prominent lawyers in this uh, field uh, as our guests. Uh, we've got Lord Kerr of Tunnamore, uh, and Lord Kerr, of course, is very well known to many of us, um, a prominent career at the bar, taking silk in 1983, a High Court judge in 1993, Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland in 2004, and since then, uh, of course, very well known I think he was the last uh, uh, judge to be appointed to the House of Lords. And of course, he's, he's been a constant presence until his recent retirement on the bench at the Supreme Court. So we're very pleased to have him. And alongside him, we have Nuala Mull. And Nuala Mull, of course, uh, well known to, to all of us, no doubt, uh, founded the Air Centre more, more than uh, 25 years ago now. And you know, the Air Centre has done fabulous work, you know, real heroes in the field of human rights law, uh, for all kinds of groundbreaking work involving migration, children, all kinds of related issues uh, in Strasbourg, and also in the related field of European Union. Law. Indeed, they do quite a lot of crossover work. I knew there's been involved in more than 100 cases and uh, has trained just about everyone in the European Union, I think, on some issue or another in the field of human rights law. OK, before we kick off, I should just tell you our housekeeping arrangements. So... Uh, this is being done as a, a seminar format, and so all those of you who are watching um, are doing so, you've been muted. Um, if you have a question to ask, you can post it using the Q&A function, and um, I'll pick up with the questions uh, once we've kind of finished with our primary talking subject matter. Um, the webinar is being recorded so that um, if anyone does unmute themselves and speak, that's also a possibility, um, you'd be recorded. And so just be aware of that uh, uh, happenstance. Okay, well, uh, and, oh yes, the other thing is if, if, if you've got any technical difficulties, um, I just either try and log back in, that usually works for most people, but also in the chat function, there are some technical instructions and you can always communicate there if you've got a techn technical uh, a techno problem. Okay then, well, without further ado, um, I'm going to, give uh, our learned panel the opportunity to um, start speaking. And to, say, to start off with, um, Nuva's going to talk to us, I think, about uh, one or two of her cases. And this evening's format is very informal, yes. I mean, it's going to be really very much uh, a conversation with people sparking ideas off one another. Um, Nuva's perhaps, Nuva's got has been involved in a, a number of very interesting developments historically and very recently. And so Nuva will probably be the spark that lights the fire throughout this session. But uh, the rest of us will chip in. Okay, so to start off with, Nuala, um, I think one of the things you said you might talk about was um, the, the sort of early days of how children's rights were first litigated in the Strasbourg court. Do you want to tell us something about that? May I just say what an honour it is to be on a panel with Lord Kerr, who I've admired from afar and from close to occasionally for a long time for the wonderful contribution he's made to the jurisprudence of the UK and how he's brought the Strasbourg judgments, many of the good ones, and fortunately not most of the bad ones, brought them home to our courts. And it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with him this evening. I'm going to go back a uh, hundred million years now to uh, before I first started litigating in Strasbourg. I started litigating in Strasbourg in 1992, when I think many of the people who are here were perhaps not born, perhaps at school, perhaps starting their careers. Um, but at that time, when the custodial parents of British children were being deported, and the assumption was that the British children should go with them, the Strasbourg case law said that uh, it didn't matter that these children were British, not at all. 
because they were only British, because British nationality law gave British nationality to everybody who was born in the UK because we had the US solely at the time. And we really thought that there was no room to challenge that string, string of cases. But of course, the British Nationality Act of 1981 changed all of that and restricted British citizenship to the children of parents uh, who had rights in the UK so that we had a jus sanguinis principle rather than jus soli. So I took uh, three cases at various different times, arguing that now that Parliament in its wisdom had given British citizenship to these children on purpose, because their parents qualified, because they were settled or British, they were in a different position from the children in the very early case law. And the first case, one of the, I can't remember what order we took them in. One was a case called Sarabji, and it was about a little girl who was born with a condition called trigger thumbs. This meant she couldn't actually use her thumbs. So she couldn't hold a pen and she couldn't hold a knife and fork. And she was booked to go in to King's College Hospital and have an hour and a half surgery, which would have resolved this problem for life so that she could have grown up like a normal child. This is a British citizen child. And the Home Office had her put on a plane to Kenya before she, the week before she was scheduled to have the surgery. Another case was a case called a Jai, where the mother had lost two previous pregnancies and the pregnancy that she was carrying then uh, was also threatening to miscarry and she had had to have stitches put in to hold the baby in place. This is a child who would have been, if brought to term, a British baby. And they wanted to put the mother on a plane in that condition. And Jaramillo was a child who was also going to be a British citizen, but whose one of his parents, his father, was a Colombian drug dealer. Uh, and the mother had given information about the Medellin drug cartel to the authorities, and they wanted to send her and this little boy back to Colombia. There wasn't a chance that they would survive for more than 20 minutes after they got off the plane because the drug cartel would have got to them. And uh, we took all these cases to Strasbourg and I was quite confident that with the change, stupidly confident, that with the change in the basis of their British citizenship, the court would uh, see what we were arguing, but it didn't. It declared the cases inadmissible. I'm very happy to tell you that apart from Sarabji, who was already on the plane, uh, the other two were able to stay and little Ajayi baby came into our office and gooed a guard and giggled quite happily at the time. Part of the problem was that uh, the UK hadn't ratified Protocol 4 to the European Convention on Human Rights, which prohibits you from expelling or excluding your own nationals. It still hasn't ratified Protocol 4, and so we couldn't invoke uh, the full panoply of arguments, including that you cannot exclude or constructively exclude your own nationals. And it's quite interesting because some of you may read the European Human Rights Law Review, which I have the pleasure of sitting on the editorial board of, and I was lucky to be able to write a piece for the very first issue of the European Human Rights Law Review, which was called the constructive deportation of British citizens. And I think I found that uh, all those hours spent learning Roman law with Professor Ian Brownlee in Oxford came to fruition then because I learned all about 
exile and what an appalling punishment it was considered in classical times. But of course, uh, as we moved on, the UK Supreme Court put an end to that uh, inhuman attitude towards British citizen children. Lord Kerr, are you tempted to uh, say anything at this juncture as uh, there's the opportunity to say something from the perspective of the uh, Supreme Court? I suspect, uh, no, well, before I start, uh, let me, um, first of all, in the interest of uh, seeming modesty, uh, disavow all of uh, Nola's compliments, but in, in, in so far as they're justified, may I return them in full uh, measure. Uh, Nola occupies a very special place in, in human rights history. The establishment of the Air Centre and its work over the time that she has been in charge of it is, if not completely unrivalable, uh, occupies a, a special place in the jurisprudence uh, of uh, human rights. And uh, I have had the great good fortune to sit in a number of cases where the Air Centre has been an intervener. And it just gives me the opportunity to say how important interventions are. They're much more frequent now than they used to be. And there are some who believe that uh, we should be a lot more sparing in our grant of uh, permission uh, for uh, interventions. I don't share that view at all. Uh, I mean, the, the cases that we have to deal with are uh, sufficiently difficult and challenging that any assistance that we can get from any quarter is very welcome. Uh, now, having said that, uh, on the what I anticipate uh, uh, Nola was referring to, the case of ZH, uh, we have, were asked to, to deal with two principal questions. We were asked to deal with a great many more than that, but certainly in my estimation, there were two uh, principal questions. The first, was uh, how should we deal with the uh, business of the uh, primary interest uh, of the child? I shouldn't say the primary uh, interest. It is a primary interest. And I confess that uh, in ZH and in subsequent cases, I find that a slightly slippery concept. Uh, what is a primary consideration uh, when one's dealing with the interest of the child? Uh, in ZH, I was tempted, probably unwisely in retrospect, uh, to say that customarily uh, the outcome of a dispute uh, in relation to the best interest of the child should mean uh, that uh, the child's interests will trump all others. I didn't quite put it that way, but it did seem to me that when you're dealing with the interests of a child and you're to accord it the status of a primary consideration, it was quite um, difficult uh, to distinguish that uh, from the primary consideration. Uh, but uh, that was not espoused by the other members of the court in ZH and it has been uh, retreated from uh, somewhat uh, in subsequent cases. But however you approach the question of the, the, the um, primary consideration uh, or the best interest of the child being a primary consideration, it, it must rank, in my view, extremely high. In, in a later case of Zumba, uh, Lord Hodge uh, was careful to point out uh, that uh, while assessing uh, proportionality, the best interest of the child must be a primary consideration. He emphasized there was not always the only primary consideration. I suppose if one wanted to be uh, pedantic, uh, that seemed to imply uh, that uh, there may be occasions when it is the only uh, primary uh, consideration. But I don't think that the final word has been spoken 
uh, on what uh, um, what means one adopts in order to ensure that the best interest of the child is a primary consideration. I think as a matter of first principle, it must be quite difficult to conceive of uh, considerations which would outrank uh, a child's interest. For instance, in, in the cases that, um, that uh, uh, Nola uh, has mentioned, it's, it seems to me quite difficult to conceive of any uh, matter which would uh, outrank uh, the uh, interests of the uh, children in those cases. Uh, so, uh, as I say, that was the first principal issue that we had to deal with, but I'm not quite sure that we gave a definitive and um, uh, guiding uh, principle uh, for application in uh, future cases. The second uh, question, the second principal issue that we dealt with in ZH was the importance of nationality. Uh, and uh, uh, Brenda Hale in particular uh, dealt with that uh, thorny issue extremely well in my view. Uh, she made it clear just how important nationality is. Uh, and uh, children who are British citizens uh, rightly regard that as not only uh, uh, something to be cherished, but also something of real intrinsic value. Uh, and um, that, I think, will guide uh, future cases, hopefully in uh, Strasbourg, uh, uh, when one is making some evaluation of the importance of uh, nationality. Actually, the cases that Nola mentioned do exemplify the, in my view, the, the great wisdom in domesticating the European Convention on Human Rights, because between 1966 and the introduction of the Human Rights Act, and it's coming into force in October 2000, we occupied something of a, a incognita in that um, <clears throat> the um, individual citizen of, of the United Kingdom had the right of personal petition uh, to the Strasbourg court, uh, notionally at least, uh, domestic courts had to eschew any regard to the European Convention, uh, notwithstanding that in many cases that came before the courts, the convention rights were uh, prominent among those uh, that were uh, prayed in aid, uh, albeit uh, and not directly. And of course, there were some um, stentorian statements by the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords um, forbidding any consideration of the, uh, the convention. I mean, in Britain, for instance, it was suggested that um, the convention should not be allowed to become part of domestic law by the back door, as I think uh, uh, Lord Ackner uh, put it. Uh, but the unsatisfactory situation in the UK courts uh, was resolved by the uh, patriation of the convention uh, to, uh, to our shores. And uh, I think that we are at last beginning to see uh, the value of that because one of the, well, I mustn't rub it on about uh, this, but I do feel that the fact that uh, domestic courts can identify issues which uh, intensely uh, affect its citizens through the prism of the convention uh, must surely be a, a good thing for uh, the uh, fundamental human rights of, of British citizens. Anyway, that's enough rabbiting on for me. We'll, we'll go back to Nola now. Uh, 
Okay, Nula. So um, that's a really interesting exchange there between uh, in, about some of the sort of early development in the convention and how um, subsequent developments in, in, in the domestic court have run with them. Uh, so it's interesting. I, I'm, I knew I was some way behind Nula in my knowledge of this stuff. I didn't realise I was a whole quarter century behind. I didn't know about this port, Protocol 4 business. Uh, so it's fascinating, isn't it? This Protocol 4 business is almost reminiscent of what the Court of Justice was to later achieve in uh, the Zambrano line of thinking, wasn't it? Where it, uh, it kind of created a a non-expulsion right for EU citizens, which the British wouldn't have had for their own citizens. You're still muted, Nuda. Yeah, when, when Surinder Singh went before the ECJ, as it then was, the ECJ mistakenly thought that the UK had ratified Protocol 4 and worked on that principle. We didn't disabuse them of this because it was clear that this mistake was taking them in the right direction. So we let them go on thinking this. <coughs> But come 1998, when uh, the Human Rights Act came into um, into uh, into being, and then there was two years before it came into force. Navi Alawalia, the late lamented Navi Alawalia of Baden Court, was at the time uh, working at the Air Centre, and he and I went to places in England that neither of us had ever heard of before to train all kinds of judges and tribunal, uh, um, people who sat on tribunals on the Human Rights Act in this two year panic before it uh, actually came into force um, 20 years ago. So it was a frantic chase to get it it all in place and if um if brian will forgive me i just want to add a slight uh tale to what he was saying because of course the great thing about the european convention on human rights is that it doesn't just protect citizens it protects all those within the jurisdiction and is not confined to British citizens in the UK. But British citizenship is a very important thing for another reason, because of the particularly important role it has in EU law. And some of the most interesting cases about children and migration have involved the interface between the European Convention on Human Rights and EU law. So um, and, and there are two cases that we were intervened in. One was a case which I have never learned how to pronounce. I think it's Bao. It sounds a little bit like a wolf howling at the moon, which is perhaps appropriate for Halloween week, but I think it's Bao. Um, which I noticed when I was looking at it this afternoon, a perfectly respectable EU law blog referred to Mr. and Mrs. Bao as a Ghanaian couple. Mr. Bao was Danish. He was Danish of Ghanaian ethnic origin. And that's really important because the approach that the Strasbourg court has taken to family migration over the years has been quite horrifically skewed towards treating uh, third country nationals who are black and brown differently from third country nationals who were white. And we even got to the point where in one of the cases we had, they said, oh, it would be perfectly all right for this West African lady to go to Jamaica because she would fit in there. We thought, no, Jamaica, West Africa, not quite the same place. And the child similarly. But it <coughs> that was a very interesting case because uh, Mrs. Bao wasn't allowed to regularize her position in Denmark because Mr. Bao hadn't been a Danish citizen for long enough because the Danes had different rules about family reunion for uh, spouses and parents, depending on how long the Danish citizen had been Danish. 
and they had very easy rules for the spouses and families of Danish citizens by birth or those who had been Danish for more than 28 years, but rather more strict rules, in fact, prohibitively strict rules. Sorry, just let me get rid of that. Prohibitively strict rules uh, for anyone who had only, who'd been Danish for less than 28 years. I, I ask you to reflect on who you think were the Danish citizens who had been Danish for less than 28 years and who you think the Danish citizens from birth and what they looked like. And Mr. Bau, of course, had not been Danish for 28 years because he'd only come from Ghana some 10 years ago. But the uh, point was he was Danish and his children were Danish, but his wife couldn't regularize his position. And they lived in Copenhagen. Now, I don't know if any of you years ago saw a Scandi Noir program on television called The Bridge. It was a very uh, harrowing, but very well-made series. And the bridge was about the bridge that goes from Copenhagen to Malmö. And that bridge is in totality 12 kilometers long. And when you go on the train, which I've done from Copenhagen to Malmö, it takes 38 minutes to cross. So uh, because Mr. Bau was a Danish citizen, uh, although he and his family were not allowed to live together in Denmark, they could just hop on the bridge and go across to Malmö and live in, Ma in uh, Malmö where he could be there because he was exercising his treaty rights as an EU national. So every morning he got up, got on the train, went to his job in Copenhagen and came back in the evening and had his totally lawful residence in Malmö. Uh, but he couldn't have his wife back with him in Copenhagen. It was completely ridiculous. Uh, and of course, as soon as they had finished uh, the whole palaver, they could have come back to um, Denmark on the Surinder Singh principle. And the court uh, didn't actually want to look at this at all. It said, hmm, EU law, very interesting. But it couldn't see that it was a completely disproportionate interference with these, this family and these children's rights to make them go and live 38 right minutes away on a train ride because the, the father and husband had had the misfortune not to have been a Danish citizen for long enough. And then we had Jeunesse against the Netherlands, an, another similar case where EU law came in because uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jeunesse came from Suriname, which was a uh, Dutch uh, col former colony, and uh, the Dutch authorities wouldn't allow Mrs. Jeunesse to regularize her position, or perhaps it was Mr., I don't remember. Anyway, the children were all Dutch citizens, and one of the spouses was a Dutch citizen, and they said they all had to go back to Suriname, and it wouldn't ha hurt them to go back to Suriname because they all spoke Dutch in Suriname anyway. Um, and we intervened to point out to them that as these were Dutch citizens, they could go and live anywhere in Europe they wanted, except the Netherlands, which seems an extraordinarily strange thing. But this was not a point that the court really wanted to pick up on either. And in fact, um, three dissenting judges, Mark Villiger, Paul Marnie, and Johan Silvis, were emphatic in disagreeing with the majority of the court that it was a violation of the convention not to let the Jeunesse family live together. So we've had an uphill task. Uh, even when you tried to introduce into the European Convention on Human Rights the complementary rights that people had because of their citizenship, uh, because of their citizenship of a, the country where they lived or wanted to live, meant that they were also citizens of the European Union. And that was a very uh, interesting 
development. Um, I'll stop there because uh, I want to move on later to the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and then other things. But I wonder if uh, Brian has got some things he would like to say about the interface between the ECHR and EU law. He's muted. In light of our um, departure from the EU, uh, not a great deal to say, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, I, I think that the case that uh, Nola referred to is an example of the tension that can arise between uh, community rights and, um, and convention rights. And it does seem to me, although I haven't addressed this uh, issue directly in any uh, of the judgments that I've written, it, it does seem to me that certainly while we remained a, a member of the European uh, Union, it, it was necessary in examining the content of the convention rights uh, to have regard to uh, the rights that one enjoyed as a European citizen. Uh, and uh, the example that Nuri gave of the uh, family being uh, allowed to live in Malmo but uh, refused uh, permission to live in Copenhagen, since that uh, was possible by dint of the exercise of uh, uh, European Union right, it seems to me that a very strong argument can be made that when the content of the convention right is in play, you can't simply disregard uh, the rights that the family may enjoy uh, coming from, uh, coming directly from uh, another source. Because of course, uh, proportionality uh, looms very large in uh, the uh, uh, decision as to what is in the best interest uh, of the child and, and the content of uh, the Article 8 right. Uh, and if it is the position, as it was, uh, that in that case, the family could have recourse to the uh, European Union rights, to leave that severely out of account in making an assessment of the convention rights, uh, seems to me to be, well, not only illogical, uh, but uh, plainly wrong-headed. Uh, you can't, I think, uh, demarcate uh, and segregate uh, rights in that way. When you're dealing with uh, a, a human individual's rights, uh, then simply because it derives from another body of law uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't enter the uh, proportionality uh, equation. Uh, after all, the most important uh, of the four elements of proportionality is a, a, a balancing between the uh, claims for a legitimate aim and the impact that it's going to have uh, on the family. Uh, uh, this may all prove to be academic for us in the future. Uh, hello, my own personal view is that uh, one can't uh, leave out of the count uh, the onward march of uh, rights uh, uh, under the European Union uh, in deciding the content of uh, uh, fundamental human rights uh, of uh, United Kingdom citizens in the future. But that's perhaps a, a rather more controversial uh, topic that, that we need to engage in uh, on this occasion. But I think that's all I want to say at the moment, because I, I, I am conscious that um, we're hoping to end it 6.30 and, and for my part I think it would be very helpful to deal with uh, some uh, questions. Incidentally I'm afraid I may have to leave slightly before 6.30 but I'll, I'll stay as long as I possibly can. Okay excellent. Um, in that case Nula, are there any more cases that you'd like to talk about Nula? I think you have got a couple more. carry on talking about the cases that I've been involved in because you can never stop a lawyer once you give her free range to talk about her own cases. Um, it, we could go on till nine o'clock. 
but I do think it's <laughs> very important for, uh, no, we're not going on till nine o'clock. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> um, but what I think that's very important is the role of the European, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the role, the increasing role that it has played in the jurisprudence of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. And one of the things that I think has been very important is that the court in Strasbourg, either by directly applying Article 53 of the convention, which says you can't apply the convention in a way that would diminish the rights that are guaranteed under national law or under any other uh, treaty to which you're a party. And obviously everyone is a party to the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, except certain large countries to the west of us that we shall not name. Um, but the UNCRC is very important uh, and is, referred to frequently. There's a contrast here because we find regularly in the domestic courts here in the UK, and I'd be very interested to hear what uh, Brian's experience of this is, um, that it's quite frequently argued by government lawyers that uh, whilst of course the UN is uh, the UK is second to no one in its respect for the rights of the child. They would like respectfully to remind the court that it forms no part of English law. And I think that that is a real problem. And the lack of, uh, lack of incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child into domestic law is a problem. Mm. Well... <laughs> Uh, I, um, in a case called SG, uh, embarked on a radical uh, on a radical view that um, this dualist theory, whereby unincorporated uh, treaties can never form part of uh, domestic law, required to be revisited, uh, and. Uh, I had the temerity to suggest that uh, it might be time for us to recognize that where uh, an international treaty to which we have subscribed uh, invests individuals with uh, human rights, uh, that uh, that ought to be given uh, force in, in domestic law. Uh, none of my colleagues uh, <laughs> thought that that was a good idea. I'm told uh, subsequently that a, a, a distinguished silk addressing a conference said, oh, well, um, Lord Kerr's view will probably be vindicated, but it'll take about 200 years. <laughs> but that does seem to me to be something uh, slightly illogical about uh, the United Kingdom as a country committing itself to a, a solemn uh, business of uh, subscribing to uh, a, uh, an international treaty whereby it proclaims uh, that these uh, are the uh, edicts, these are the tenets uh, which they uh, declaim to everyone uh, is going to guide uh, the United Kingdom's observance of whatever the, the terms of the treaty are. It does seem to me to be a, a certain illogicality in saying, well, that's all very fine, but we're not going to give you access to those rights. You, you can't enforce them in our courts. Mm. Uh, and I fondly hope that perhaps in less than 200 years time, uh, this matter will be looked at again. Uh, the other thing about that I might want just to pick up on very uh, uh, briefly is the, the business of proportionality when it comes to uh, the um, uh, interests of the, the best interests of the child. Um, it, it is very important to identify at a, at a very early stage 
what the legitimate aim is, because uh, that will, I think, infuse one's thinking about how one sets about applying the four uh, stages of proportionality. And I think a very good example of that, of the discussion about that, is the case of Hesham Ali. It's a case in which um, I took the view that the only uh, possible uh, legitimate aim was uh, the um, prevention of disorder and crime. Not all of my colleagues uh, agreed with that. Uh, but uh, as I say, that really infuses one's uh, consideration of the three remaining stages of, uh, uh, of the proportionality exercise. And it, perhaps I could just say two or three sentences about the role of the appellate court uh, in uh, deciding whether a, a particular interference with the convention right is uh, proportionate. Uh, the view uh, has been taken uh, that uh, an appellate court should be very reticent uh, about second guessing uh, a decision of a first instance court uh, on the matter of uh, proportionality. Uh, I emphatically disagree with that. Uh, the whole question of proportionality is, it requires of the tribunal making a judgment on that, uh, the application of uh, its view uh, as to whether or not, uh, A, there's a legitimate aim, uh, B, whether the uh, interference uh, is uh, justified, uh, and C, uh, uh, carrying out the uh, competing exercise of the pursuit of the legitimate aim and the uh, impact on the individual, uh, including, of course, whether measures which uh, fall short of the, uh, the uh, uh, interference, the extent of the interference uh, would have been sufficient uh, to achieve the uh, avowed aim. And I don't think, uh, at least I, I firmly believe that that it's an exercise which cannot be abdicated by an appellate court uh, to uh, a first instance court. Obviously, one needs to pay considerable uh, respect and, and to examine very closely the reasons articulated by the first instance judge. But that, I think, uh, is as far as it goes. It, it, uh, an appellate court, like every other public authority, is bound by the terms of Section 6 of the Human Rights Act, not to act in a way which is incompatible with uh, an individual's uh, convention rights. Uh, and one simply cannot say, I believe, well, because uh, Mr. Justice X and Mrs. Justice X uh, examined this question very carefully and came to a decision which fell within the spectrum of reasonable answers, uh, that that really is a final answer. Uh, a public authority must make sure for itself, based on its own consideration of the question, uh, whether uh, the interference is proportionate. Uh, that's enough for me at the moment. No, well, I think what Brian has just said shows us all how sadly he is missed from the UK <laughs> Supreme Court and we'd loved him to have stayed on forever but alas no. Uh, we, we started off this evening uh, with some of the very first cases that we at the Air Centre took on children and migration way back when in 1992. Uh, and I, I just want to remind you all what we had to do to take those cases. We were sitting in our office in Brixton. There was no internet. Can I say that again? To those of you who can't imagine a world without the internet, there was no internet. And once a week, we sent an intern to the library of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law in Russell Square, 
armed with a 10 pound photocopying card to go and look up all the cases of the European Court of Human Rights that we wanted to cite, photocopy them and bring them home. They couldn't even call us to say, you've said this case or that case, but it, because there were no mobile phones either. So somebody had to go on the tube from Brixton to Russell Square and do all of this. And when we did the case of D against the UK about the man dying of AIDS, one of our interns had to make 63 telephone calls to find out what provision there was for AIDS sufferers in other countries in the world so that we could be sure that we were absolutely correct when we said St. Kitts was the only place in the world where there was no treatment for AIDS. And that's how we started off doing those cases like Sarabji and Ajayi and Jaramillo. And here we are now in 2020. Well, 2020 is strange for many, many, many reasons. But back in 2019, we were, we were doing cases about the rights of children born to surrogacy and their immigration rights when they came back to the country of origin. We've been involved in an Icelandic case and a Norwegian case, as well as in Protocol 16. And I don't think any of us, when we first started working on these cases back in Brixton with no email and no internet, in the 1990s could have thought that uh, we would be working on uh, surrogacy and immigration and surrogacy. But I have no idea about the cases that have come before the English courts on this point. And I don't know if Brian can tell us anything about those or if I'm putting him on the spot. I don't mind being put on the spot, but uh, I'm going to be able to answer that in a very abbreviated fashion. No, is the, is the answer. I don't know anything. Uh, I don't think any surrogate, surrogacy cases uh, uh, has come uh, before me, but I can see that it's going to present a, a very thorny problem in the future, uh, especially because uh, surrogacy seems to be uh, an import business, uh, because of the uh, and the interdict in relation to payment uh, of uh, surrogate mothers in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think I remember reading in a newspaper not too long ago uh, about the principal countries which uh, uh, provide surrogate children uh, at the behest of uh, uh, United uh, Kingdom uh, uh, would-be parents. Uh, and it seems to me that there's going to be a very significant uh, uh, and thorny problem for the courts in that particular area in the future. May I just say, um, Mark, will everybody give me indulgence to say that one of the UK's most former lawyers uh, a solicitor, not a member of Garden Court, obviously, um, in defending the rights of children and surrogacy and international children's rights. Uh, Anne-Marie Hutchinson from Dawson, Cornwall, died last week, and she is her department rights of children across borders. And I'd like to pay tribute to her and the wonderful collaboration she used to do with us and, and mourn her loss. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, well, I think we've probably given most of our kind of uh, prime topics in terms of our tour de table of um, Strasbourg developments, uh, a bit of an outing. So, so we have a little look at the questions. We're keen to get onto that. and. Um, I'm pleased to say that a couple of questions have now materialised in the question and answer window. 
which I've got open. You can open it. Either of you could open it if you click on Q&A on the corner of your screen, but I'm going to read it out anyway, so you don't have to. So the first question is, um, what do you think of the Conservatives' plans to bring in a British Bill of Rights to potentially replace the Human Rights Act? Nula. Do I have to type an answer? No, no, you can speak, you can, you can vocalise your answer. I can speak, okay. Well, you don't have to ask what they're proposing, you have to ask why they're proposing it. And I would want to be very sure that any such proposal was intended to be for the benefit of uh, strengthening human rights protection before I thought there was any merit in it at all, and I'm not even remotely convinced of that. Yes. Yes. Well, those uh, replicate my uh, sentiments uh, almost exactly. Uh, the why is... Uh, is a preliminary question to the what. Uh, why is it necessary? Uh, the Human Rights Act may not be a, a perfect enactment, uh, but it seems to me to have struck a very sensible uh, compromise between, um, on the one hand, uh, shutting us out from uh, access to a body of jurisprudence uh, which is intensely relevant to uh, the lot of uh, the UK citizen uh, in contemporary society. And on the other hand, uh, requiring the courts uh, to refrain from uh, striking down primary legislation uh, by uh, extending the power only so far as uh, we have it uh, to making a declaration of incompatibility. In these days when there is a lot of uh, discussion about uh, whether judges have become activists, a term which I think has taken on a pejorative connotation or interventionist, uh, it does well, I think, to remind oneself that it was the Human Rights Act supported by uh, all parties in Parliament, which requires judges to address the question uh, of whether uh, secondary legislation is compatible uh, or whether primary legislation is compatible and to give an indication uh, to Parliament uh, as to its view. Uh, the suggestion that, that, that uh, judges have expanded uh, the interventionist muscle, so to speak, by recourse to convention uh, jurisprudence, particularly in relation to Article 8, it is entirely misconceived when one uh, recognises the fundamental nature of the power that is given to the court. And as I say, uh, one reminds oneself that this is a power which was given by Parliament. It's Parliament uh, which says to us, please look at this uh, item of legislation and tell us whether you, an independent institution, if you like a vouching or checking, checking mechanism, whether you think uh, that we've done the right thing here. Uh, and if you come and tell us, well, it is in our estimation incompatible with the convention, uh, we would take that on board as being very interesting. But it doesn't behove us to do anything about it. And of course, in relation to uh, prisoners' voters' rights, that's exactly what Parliament uh, decided to do, that it wasn't going to do anything. Uh, and we as judges don't complain. We are merely performing the task uh, that was asked of us uh, by Parliament. And while uh, the constraints of office are to a certain extent loosened on me now, it, it may uh, be pertinent for me to say that in a healthy democracy, uh, an institution such as Parliament uh, should rejoice in the fact that 
instruments which they pass, which they uh, seek to uh, introduce into law, have to go through this vouching or checking mechanism because the parliament is able to say to the citizens, well, we have proposed this measure. Uh, we have asked the courts to look at it. The courts have either said, yes, it's perfectly compatible, or we believe that it is incompatible for X, Y, and Z uh, reasons. Uh, and that, it seems to me, should be recognised as the operating uh, of a healthy democracy. It's the cornerstone uh, uh, of uh, our traditional notions of democracy, surely, uh, that uh, no organ of the state should have access to unbridled power, uh, because that way totalitarianism uh, lies. Uh, and uh, I think rather than uh, suggesting that the courts have uh, expanded the uh, area of uh, interference, the, the proper reaction of a fully informed uh, and responsible uh, politician must be, well, this is the way that we in the United Kingdom operate. This is how we should uh, conduct our business. Anyway, that's uh, uh, got it off my chest. <laughs> you, can, you can come up with something else now, uh, Miles. Okay, excellent. Mark, that's sorry, Mark. <laughs> that certainly spurred an interesting exchange. Um, now, um, the next question that's come up, uh, slightly more immigration-specific one, this one, and it turns on the famous minimum income criteria that was... Uh, introduced back in 2012 and upheld by the Supreme Court in M.M. Le M. M. Lebanon. And the question goes, um, given that given that M.M. Lebanon upheld that criteria, uh, it effectively upheld the legitimate aim that was part of that criteria, i.e. protecting the economic well-being of the UK. And in so doing, it effectively upheld this idea that if you didn't earn 18 and a half grand or you didn't have uh, savings to make, make the difference, um, you might be reduced to a Skype family, i.e. Well, it's obvious what that is. Um, what ideas do the panellists have about whether that approach is compatible with human rights as we now see it? Nula. to require uh, people to have an income of that level. And I think that was the thrust of a lot of the litigation in MM Lebanon. I think that was actually, was that not Navi Alawalia's last case before he died? I think anyway, so. it seems to me that, um, that it was a, um, it, to prohibit family reunification for people who are through no fault of their own unable to uh, earn enough money to cross that threshold seems to me to be uh, unacceptable. But at the same time, uh, it's important to remember that immigration control has always been considered in Strasbourg and argued by the UK government to be about the economic well-being of the country. And the court has always accepted that as a legitimate aim. I think there has to be some more humane system for ensuring that uh, people are able to be reunited with their families, many of whom will come if they if if they're permitted to come, will come and work, and pay tax and contribute to the economy. And I think just keeping families apart on financial grounds is really unacceptable. 
but I do think that uh, it's a very complicated and tricky problem and there isn't a simple answer to it. As I said, I'm not an economist and I'm not very good at maths. <laughs> well, uh, this is a, a, a difficult area. It needs to be remembered, of course, uh, that uh, the pursuit of a legitimate aim is but one, uh, albeit a very important uh, uh, stage of, of the proportionality exercise. For my own part, I find it slightly uh, controversial to say that keeping uh, aspiring migrants out of the United Kingdom simply on the grounds of apprehending uh, uh, cost to the exchequer in the form of benefits payments uh, is a, a somewhat controversial proposition. Uh, but uh, even if one accepts that it is a legitimate aim, uh, the question is whether the balance that has to be struck between preserving family unit, which after all is the the unit which traditionally uh, uh, underpinned uh, our society, there has to be a very careful examination of whether that uh, criterion, if it does qualify as a legitimate aim, uh, strikes that proper uh, balance. Uh, as Newell has said, uh, the uh, experience uh, of most uh, uh, societal observers or uh, the informed uh, view of most uh, commentators on this is that migrants on the whole uh, do not represent uh, in the long term a, a substantial charge uh, on the exchequer. Uh, to the contrary, they frequently uh, contribute uh, significantly uh, to uh, the uh, exchequer in the form of the payment of taxes and so on. Uh, so it, it does seem to me that there's a real danger in accepting rather too glibly uh, that uh, a, unless uh, a, a migrant can show that she or he has financial support to, to a certain level, that that, that will uh, outweigh all other considerations. Uh, and uh, of course, it's, it's frequently the case uh, where there is a big debate uh, as to the application of the four stages of proportionality. What's conspicuously lacking is empirical uh, evidence to support uh, propositions which are very easily made, but sometimes extremely difficult to demonstrate. Uh, so uh, I anticipate that uh, there may well be further challenges to this. Uh, and it's not for me to say, but it does seem uh, sensible that there should be a very close examination of the evidence proffered uh, to support sweeping propositions such as uh, the exchequer can't afford uh, to have these people come unless they can be assured of an immediate uh, uh, financial subvention uh, from the relatives whom they wish to join. Mark, may I add something? Yes, do. Yes, I just want to say that we have heard a lot from government in the last few months about the wonderful work being done by frontline NHS workers and by other key workers during the pandemic. And very, very many of those workers would not be able to meet that threshold because we don't pay them enough. Thank you very much. Well, really interesting points there. Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I imagine that um, although MM Lebanon, of course, upheld the test as, as a matter of law in terms of its you know, staying in the immigration rules, I suppose that, um, strictly speaking, given that deportation cases can win, even with serious criminals, if they establish very compelling considerations, 
I would have thought that a migrant who wanted to come, you know, a migrant family could be reunited, even though they didn't have enough money, as long as they showed something like insurmountable obstacles to life abroad or very compelling considerations in their case. It can't be, it can't be an automatic knockout, one wouldn't have thought. Anyway, working our way through these questions, yeah. Um, okay. Well, here's a, this is a slightly broader one, but uh, why not? Why not throw it out? Um, what uh, contribution can human rights make to addressing the challenges associated with protecting the environment? <laughs> well, there, there have uh, Article Eight has always been used in the handful of cases about protecting the environment or, or that are related to environmental issues. Article 8 has always been the one that's used. Um, Lopez Ostra and the Guerra and uh, all the cases about environmental disasters and uh, toxic fumes and families having to live uh, in unacceptable levels of pollution and so forth. But I don't think the European Convention on Human Rights is the right instrument. There are other uh, international human rights instruments, but the European Convention is really not the one because it's about individual rights and uh, the climate change and environmental issues are about collective and societal rights. Of course, they affect individuals. Um, you know, when I walk out onto the street here in central London, I fill my individual lungs with polluted air, but I think uh, environmental issues are for a different instrument and not for the ECHR. Yes, well, I, I, I broadly agree with that. Uh, uh, it's difficult to envisage uh, a, um, a viable claim by uh, an individual seeking to uh, achieve a, a general improvement in environmental conditions. The only thing that I, I, I would mention perhaps is that uh, where individual uh, people have been uh, affected by uh, the polluted air in cities, it does seem to me that there is a potential for uh, seeking to rely uh, on uh, Article 8 rights. I mean, one thinks of the children who have said, are said to have died in London uh, as a result of their exposure to polluted air uh, and levels of pollution their children's playgrounds and so on uh, could conceivably give rise uh, to a, a claim uh, on an individual basis. But no less unquestionably right. I mean, probably the better vehicle for this is uh, or was uh, under a European uh, law. But again, I harken back to what I said earlier, that simply because we are no longer a member of the European Union does not mean to say that uh, uh, thinking that is reflected in uh, uh, the finding of the Court of Justice of the European Union in relation to other states you know, should necessarily be left out of account uh, when uh, addressing the content of human rights uh, in the domestic setting. I think that's all I can say at, that, uh, at this point. Sorry, I may have to leave fairly soon. I think that's a message just come through for me. But I'll, I'll hang on for another few minutes at least. Right, I'm just looking at the next question. Some more have turned up now. Um, OK, well, the here's one. The, the, the government continues to assert that allowing unaccompanied minors, see, uh, uh, asylum seeking minors, to sponsor their parents as part of family reunification would encourage human trafficking. What are the human rights implications of that? What? 
Mark, could you repeat that, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the government asserts that allowing unaccompanied asylum-seeking children to sponsor their parents under family reunification can encourage human trafficking. What are the human rights implications of that assertion? I'm going to suggest that Brian goes first. Isn't that a cop Because he's in a hurry. <laughs> That's a real cop out. <laughs> uh, well, I, I simply don't understand the uh, the basis of the assertion. Uh, the uh, so-called sponsorship of uh, parents by children. Uh, I can't find a, a nexus, uh, an obvious nexus between that uh, and uh, human trafficking. The, the essence of the uh, Article 8 right in the context uh, of children is the recognition, the traditional recognition of the best interest of the child being served by belonging to a unit. It doesn't have to be the traditional nuclear family, but belonging to a unit where they can be exposed to influences uh, from responsible adults uh, and that they can mature in a way which reflects uh, the, the values and standards of contemporary society. Uh, I honestly I can't uh, see that a child who uh, is a British citizen is uh, habitually resident here, uh, that that child aspiring and his, his or her family aspiring uh, to be reunited as a unit uh, leads uh, in any obvious way to an increase in human trafficking. Uh, perhaps I, I'm missing the point. It may be that uh, an elaboration of the uh, so-called uh, avowed, avowed uh, connection between the two might make me uh, able to, to address the, the, uh, the question in a more pointed way, but I can't at the moment see that there is any uh, nexus between the two. And again, just to hop back on an earlier theme, uh, before accepting that assertion, uh, one would need to examine the evidence in an empirical way to see what uh, support there was for it. It's, it's again, perhaps an example of a glib assertion being made uh, without the production of any evidence uh, to support it. Over to you, Nuala. Well, I think that the answer to this is that if you have unaccompanied children who have come to the UK, and I just want everyone to reflect for a moment of the trajectories of the sort of journeys that they have made to get here, over deserts, over mountains, across seas, abused in camps, abused by smugglers, et cetera, et cetera, by the time they get here. And once they have got status here in the UK and they have identified the whereabouts of their families and want to be reunited with them, to raise the issue that this is going to encourage human traffickers is an admission that the systems that we have are systems which are not fit for purpose. They are systems which are not fit for identifying victims of trafficking, for providing mm -hmm. uh, protection to victims of trafficking, <coughs> for identifying and prosecuting traffickers. But it seems to me that it's a slightly disingenuous uh, other argument for imposing more restrictive immigration controls on young people who have already been through horrific, horrific trajectories to get from where they started to the UK. And uh, I would like to be sure that this was going to be directed towards a genuine desire to eradicate trafficking 
and not a more venal desire to restrict migration. And certainly in individual cases, I mean, it has to be very hard to see how the policy is uh, sufficiently evidence-based, isn't it? There's, there would be, I mean, in individual cases, one would have to be confident that the policy really did, did serve the legitimate aim. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay. Um, a, a question I had, actually, be, 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 before, we, before we lose Lord Kerr, in fact, was um, do, do, do we think that the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which, which is going to exit, <laughs> exit stage left pretty fast because it is the bit of the... Uh, human rights fabric for which you know the UK has the least enthusiasm. Do, do, do we do we think the departure from the UK of the charter from the charter regime? Um, what implications will that have for the future development of UK law? Well, as I said already, Mark, uh, I don't believe that our uh, leaving the European Union means that we are going to shut our face to all uh, developments. Uh, in Europe, both in terms of governmental action and in terms of the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of uh, the EU. Certainly, so far as the Charter rights, those will not be accessible directly by uh, United Kingdom citizens. But the development of uh, the Charter in the future, it's uh, uh, finding expression in decisions of uh, individual European countries and ultimately the Court of Justice of the European Union must be a rich source of uh, information about how enlightened countries uh, deal with uh, endemic uh, human rights problems. And, and simply because we don't have direct access to the rights and trial of the Charter, it doesn't mean uh, that we shouldn't begin a bit an examination of how those rights have found expression uh, in uh, European countries and in the Court of Justice, uh, because any enlightened contemporary approach uh, to fundamental human rights uh, questions uh, has to draw on all uh, manner of sources uh, and uh, simply to shut our, our face to uh, uh, developments in that area uh, seems to me to be uh, uh, counterproductive and illogical. So we may not have direct access to, to the Charter, but I would expect uh, imaginative uh, and uh, enterprising advocates in the future uh, to uh, draw on those uh, sources of information in order to illustrate to our courts uh, what an enlightened approach, uh, which has to shift all the time. Uh, as society's values and standards uh, uh, change, uh, that an enlightened approach, in much the same way as one would have recourse to uh, jurisprudence in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, uh, and America, uh, why shouldn't we uh, deal uh, with problems that we encounter in the future by looking at how they've been dealt with uh, in other uh, countries whose standards and values are broadly reflective of our, of our own. You know? I, I, I'd like to share Lord Carr's optimism, and I'm very glad that he is encouraging us all to believe that a piecemeal improvement, step by step, can work to about a better jurisprudence and a better legal landscape for us all. My only thing is I regret the passing of the Charter because I regret the passing of Article 24, which brought the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into enforceable law in the UK, directly enforceable law, as we have to bring the... Europe, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in by the back door, but we lose that when we lose the Charter in any area of EU law or to which EU law applied. But more importantly, perhaps, as a procedural lawyer, is Article 47 of the Charter, which expressly gives the full procedural rights found in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights 
to immigration matters because the court in Strasbourg in Maui said that Article 6 does not apply to immigration matters, so people don't have the full rights of Article 6 in immigration cases. But if it's a matter that is regulated by EU law, the explanatory notes to the Charter make it clear that Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, paradoxically, applies to all matters that are regulated by EU law. So those are the two points where I particularly regret the passing of the Charter. Thanks very much for that. Um, I, wonder if, uh, I wonder if Lord Kerr has, uh, has departed. Uh, maybe he's, uh, I know he was on a bit of a time limit and that might be the, uh, the end of his uh, most welcome contributions. Anyway, hugely grateful to, uh, to him. Um, Nula, anything else, um, and, 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 anything else you feel that you'd like to add uh, now the juice oh. is playing? <laughs> No, I, I, I'm very happy to answer any other questions anybody has, but I can temptingly see that there are nine questions, but when I click on it, I can only get the ones we've already answered, but that's probably because I'm clicking the wrong thing. No, I think, I think, I think, uh, I, I think we have actually answered most of the ones that are uh, readily answerable within the terms in which we're, um, we've advertised ourselves. Yeah, um, I, I wonder, before, before we depart, yeah, perhaps I could have a... Have a a question when I've got the benefit of you. Um, where next do we think the best interest of the child might go? Because we've seen the, we've seen the Supreme Court um, mull on, in a number of cases about the direction of travel with it. And we've seen in domestic law, albeit often a few years later than we might have thought, the judges usually, you know, we, we usually all catch up with them. Um, the thinking from the Supreme Court, but um, you know, so, in, so in deportation cases, for example, children face the test if their far if their parent has been uh, sentenced to more than four years imprisonment. The test they face is very compelling circumstances going beyond undue harshness. Is that compatible with a rounded assessment? You know that the Strasbourg Court would apply. What do you think? Well, it's quite interesting. If you go to um, General Comment 14 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the general comment <coughs> that elaborates the meaning of Article 3, the best interests of the child, it sets out uh, a number of key elements and that it shows that states have got to look at it when they are Divide it, devising legislation, when they are taking administrative decisions, when they're implementing those decisions, and when they're judicially reviewing them. And uh, one of the things that's quite important, I was reading through the um, Human Rights Committee's review, the, the domestic uh, parliament, parliamentary Human Rights Committee's review of the UK's performance under the UN uh, CRC reporting requirements and uh, what they said was that there doesn't seem to be rights of the child embedded in the cross departmental um, arrangements and that although there is a minister for children he's located in whichever uh, department the government chooses to park him in or her um, rather than having a, a, a children's rights going right across all the government departments. And I think we could see in the UK, we, uh, particularly the Home Office, um, in the UK we could see an enormous change if there was a minister for children who had a seat in the cabinet. Because unless and until you have a minister for children with a seat in the cabinet, it's always going to be regarded as a rather second class job. That's interesting. Well, that might be the kick that policy making needs. Yeah. OK, well, I, as I say, I think, I think we've, um, we've answered all the questions that we can really answer of those that have been put to us. And um, I think it just remains for me to thank, uh, thank you, Nula, so much for your participation in the session. Uh, thanks for bringing your expertise uh, to the table. Um, to those watching, um, this is the first of actually two sessions uh, that
that we're hosting in this series of ECHR 70s sessions at Garden Court with the Air Centre. Um, and the second event in that partnership will feature a few of us, um, including Nulu and I once again, um, and several of our colleagues um, with, with lots of litigation experience, talking about current issues and past issues, interesting issues, generally speaking, in uh, Strasbourg and domestic litigation. So I think that's on the 17th of November. But anyway, it's on the advertised on the Garden Court website. OK, thanks very much, everyone. Nice to see you all. We're signing off now. Cheerio.